Welcome to the message for Sunday, April 21st, 2024. This is the fourth Sunday of Easter. I'm Pastor Teresa Heiser from the Penns Valley Charge of the United Methodist Church. And we are in the middle of a message series post-Easter called Living in a Post-Resurrection World. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about trust and do. So we're going to begin now with these centering words. Faith is lived in the doing, not just the believing and declaring. Our first scripture passage comes from the book of Acts. We're going to chapter 4. And in this particular passage, Peter is called before the authorities because he has healed someone. We talked about this last week, and it really surprised people that this person well-known to many people had been healed right in front of their eyes. And let's just say that the authorities are not very happy about this. And so Peter's called out before the authorities, and I mean everyone. It was a who's who of authorities, and testifies to the salvation available In Jesus Christ. This is Acts chapter 4, verses 5 through 12. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible, copyright 1995. This is a word for word translation of the original language. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes were gathered together in Jerusalem. And Annas, the high priest, was there, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and all who were of high priestly descent. When they had placed them in the center, they began to inquire, by what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you And to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name, this man stands here before you in good health. He is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Our second passage comes from the Gospel of John. This is chapter 10. I'm going to be reading verses 11 to 18. Now, in this passage, you've heard it probably many times, Christ calls himself the Good Shepherd. Now, every sheep has a mind and a will of its own. And it needs a shepherd, a good shepherd who speaks and the sheep know the voice and is able to do for the sheep what the sheep cannot do for themselves. So hear these words. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me, even as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep which are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will hear my voice, and they will become one flock with one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Our final passage, and it is really the basis of our message today, is from 1 John chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 16 to 24. And in this passage, Jesus Christ 
loves us to the point of giving his life for us and thereby sets us an example of complete sacrificial love. So hear these words. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our heart before him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. This is his commandment that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know this, that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I just want to reiterate two of the verses again, verse 16 and 17. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Now, those two verses were from the New International Version Bible. This week's message in our Living in a Post-Resurrection World is titled Truth and Action. I was asked a couple of times this past week uh, because of passages read in the last couple of weeks why it is that Jesus and his apostles would refer to adult followers as little children. It's a good question. Children know that adults have wisdom to offer. It's why they ask a lot of questions. Have you ever noticed that? You know, when children really want to know the answers to questions that uh, their friends don't have the answers to, or they know they don't have the answer, they know the ones who have the answer, the grownups, right? And they're very, very good about asking a lot of questions. Now, that's a deeply personal humility that's required to be teachable. So the teachable are valuable to Jesus. Without that curiosity and humility of a child, you know, I can get in my own way. But I want to draw you to a scripture passage from Matthew 18, when the disciples come to Jesus and they want to know who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And really what they're asking is, who is the A-list superstar in heaven that I can emulate? And here is how Jesus answers. He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know, children are valued and loved by God, and we know that because children were valued and loved by Jesus. And they are the ones who are the best able, just naturally capable of coming to Jesus fully open-minded, wide-eyed, no agenda, no nothing except the really honest and earnest desire to learn from Jesus, to be the student who knows that the master teacher has all of the answers to the questions they have and even the questions they haven't begun to fathom. Let it be with this kind of open-mindedness that we come to hear the message today. Let us pray. Lord, as we hear the message today, may the words heard be yours and the thoughts and meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. 
It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You know, there are many in the world today who, who believe that all the problems that we have could be solved through many different things, and they will bring up many different kinds of, of ways. They might suggest better education. They might suggest different forms of government or redistribution or wider forced adoption of certain values. They might say activism. They may say different kinds of therapies. And then there are different belief systems that subscribe to different things. They may include doing good deeds, uh, morality, meditation, rituals, and more. There are people who say, if we could just get a lot of people certified in this one kind of thing, in this, uh, these certain kinds of books, and this other kind of teaching, and this prophetic teacher. In fairness, many of these ideas have some validity to them in that you may well improve the world by improving a, a single life at a time. But an honest assessment of some of the ways that I just read to you actually suggests that I with these tools, can fix myself. Now, I'm someone who, who read a great deal. I started to read a lot, uh, just poured myself into psychology books. When I turned 18, I started to read psychology books. Uh, I was just taking them in like water. And, and I learned a great deal. What I learned was that I can't fix myself. I need help. I need guidance. You know, it's... It, Free time and the will to change is not enough. I need someone who's going to help me and guide me and lead me there. So at the heart of our Christian faith is an understanding of that very point. We are like sheep with a mind and a will of our own. And a good shepherd will do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. And that does mean leading us to the people, this, the learning opportunities, the situations that are going to help us to be better in, in many different ways. But it does require, first of all, understanding that I there are things I just cannot do. <laughs> there are things I cannot do. When I started my own business, that was a really important lesson that I learned from uh, the people that I worked for for the longest time in my young adult life. And I paid attention to how they did business because they did business very, very well. One of the ways was to know what you are not good at and then you find someone who is very good at that thing, and then you partner with them and you share what you are good at with them. They share then what they're good at with you. And, and so everybody benefits from this. So trust me, there are a lot of things that I cannot do that are just life things. It's just getting along in life. And, and certainly even in my discipleship pathway, there are things that I cannot do for myself. I need a savior. Those four words, I need a savior, are excruciating for many outside of the church walls. It's painful for them to even think of saying those words in that order because they've been told all their life, you can do anything, you can do everything, you can do it all. I'm going to be very honest. I thought that too when I was very young. I can do everything anything. I can do everything and I will do it all. You know what? It didn't take too long in my young adult life to figure out it's impossible to do it all. You have to pick and choose the path that you're going to go on. And we get tired, right? We get tired. Can anyone do anything? Can anyone do everything? Thing. Can anyone do all things? We have limitations. We are human. It's wonderful when you realize that you're human and you don't know the future. And I don't even know what's for dinner tonight. I mean, that is how much of the future I do not know. I mean, that is the truth, right? So once I understand that I have those limitations, but understand also that I have this wonderful guide in my life, the Good Shepherd. So it's okay. What a weight is lifted in just knowing that. When we consider Jesus teaching alongside that of the first apostles, we can find that Christianity is about doing far more than limited to believing. 
believing has a very important part to play. But last week I talked specifically about uh, a character in history known as Pliny the Younger. And last week we were talking about how Pliny the Younger was just blown away by what Christians were doing that others would not. Now, Pliny had come to rely on fear being the only motivating factor necessary to um, really bring people into the order that was preferred. And he didn't understand why what they chose to believe caused them to do things that revealed this dedication, commitment, and integrity that was held together with Christ at the center. As I said, believing is very important because that is your first step. This is where things start to uh, really start to take root and help us to grow. But what we do with what we believe impacts not only us, but the people that are connected with us. And sometimes it's even people that we don't even notice are watching who are impacted. Last week, we considered how deeply ingrained it was to say anything to get by. If you say the right thing, you can pretty much get away with anything. And how this led people to question, you know, their shallowness, you know, the shallowness of their lives, whether they believed in anything or believed in everything. And, and you know, how this led people to really question, what am I doing? What are all of us doing? Why are we doing it this way? But until you're actually confronted with someone doing something differently, why would you question the way things have been? So this was a really important kind of um, pivot point for humanity here. The, the disciples themselves were questioning this for the first time. They'd never really been confronted with having to have Christ-centered integrity and then present that to religious and, and uh, political authority before. Because now our, we're going to have to think about our response. It can't be that knee-jerk, say anything, say whatever you need to, to get out of, of trouble. These were the first to face what Christians were going to face from that day on and frankly still do and are going to be facing for some time in that what if what I believe directly contradicts with what I am being asked to do, what I'm being expected to do by society or cultural norms, which ebb and flow and shift and change? Or what if what I believe contradicts with what I'm being commanded by my oppressor to do? Where would we be as the church without the hard examples of integrity of faith lived out by those first Christians who said, my faith has substance? Even when the authorities came against them claiming their faith had no substance, it became clearer to the Christians if their faith had no substance, why are they so troubled by Jesus? Why are they making laws that are about not following Jesus and blaspheming Jesus? If there was no substance, he wouldn't matter so much. But the ones with the perceived power find the substance of their faith in Christ more powerful because it renders their power eternally their power useless. And so they're compelled by, frankly, the evil in their authority to do something about it. But now in contrast, we see in 1 John 3, this emphasis on our actions and our truth-telling rather than relying solely on believing or declaring our faith in God. It's wonderful to believe, and it is fantastic to declare our faith in God, but our actions and our truth-telling, that's where the substance comes in. There's substance to our actions and truth-telling as communicated by John when he suggests that seeing someone in need and not being moved, compelled to do something about it, is proof that the love of God 
isn't really in that person's heart. Even if someone claims that it is, if you are unwilling or you do not feel this instant compel compulsion to give them the sandwich, say, you know what? I've got three of those at my house. I'm going to go grab a couple. I'll be right back. If that's not the first thought, if the first thought is to say, well, bless you, I'm, I'm, I hope things get better. When you know you have the remedy, ooh, when someone needs healing, the healing should be the first thing that we want to offer, the object, the resource, the time, the training, whatever. If we see meeting the needs of others as an inconvenience to us personally or unnecessary in the grand scheme of things, because it costs us something, it costs me something personally, then I don't have a servant's heart. And plenty of people work very hard to have the appearance of caring without actually doing anything. I see that every day on social media. There are a lot of great things that can happen and there are a lot of things that are organized and there's a lot of helps that happen there, but they don't happen there. They happen offline. You know, it might be used as a means to get the people to gather or to get them pointed into the direction where they can send the help or gather to help. Some will hear of a specific need and then decide that they know better than the person with the need what they actually need. And I've heard that before, what they really need is. And it won't have anything to do with the actual core immediate need. But it's something that they think will help them more than the thing they actually need in the moment. It's the craziest thing I've ever seen, but what it really is at the heart is having the appearance of helping, whereas they don't really help at all. It's sort of like telling someone who needs uh, an apple, what you really need is an apple seed because an apple seed will grow a tree. So in a few years, you can have an apple. Well, if you need the apple right now, <laughs> Probably not as helpful as, say, an apple now and maybe the apple seed as well. Serving always costs us something. That's why it's called service. It's in the doing that others see that we have that heart for God. There's joy found in being a blessing, but not only that, being blessed with resources that are needed and that we can give to them or we can give them the use of. This quote that is from Teresa of Avia has really resonated with me for so many weeks since even before Easter, but it is so applicable to really every week, and that is Christ has no body on earth but ours. Christ has no hands, arms, legs, feet, mouth on earth but ours. Serving can be exhausting. I'm just going to put it out there. Serving can be exhausting. If it was easy and fun and never cost you a thing, everybody would do it, right? But here's the thing. Serving is why we are called to be a community. The fact that it can be exhausting is another reason why we are called to be a community that serves, not relying on one or two people all the time, but to be relying on each other, not just a handful, but each other. Many hands make light the work of service in Jesus' name. All who are fully willing to make their faith in the way of Jesus real through this kind of sacrificial life are the ones who are able to say with great confidence that They've been transformed by the gospel of Jesus. And those who have not been changed, who keep the same mindset, the same set of fears, the same complaints, the same worry, are not. If we say we want peace, but aren't willing to be a peacemaker, and in some cases, even work the opposite and are contentious people starting fights or continuing fights. Do we really want peace? 
Or do we revel in the arguing? Or do we just want someone else to make the peace? And if we aren't willing to speak the truth about our very deep-seated addictions to wealth and power that the world has set in our heart, then how can we say our lives are truly centered on the agape, unconditional, and unifying love of God? You know, unifying means you bring everybody together. And I've heard a lot of people talking about wanting to bring people together, promising to bring people together. And, and I've listened to them speak. And I've heard them say things that are not unifying at all. They're quite divisive. It's not enough to believe and to say your do has to back it up. I know that it's easier to say, I believe in Jesus and I pray that God will meet another's needs. But I have to remember that God needs me to help him meet the needs of other people. He's designed me to do it. And God doesn't expect me to do everything. God does not expect you to do everything either. Because God has given all of us different gifts and graces. If we were intended to do all the same things, we would be exactly alike. Did you ever think about that? There are things I am just not designed to do and other people are so much better suited to doing. And I'm so glad because they tend to their things. I tend to my things. We've got lots of different people tending to different things. And when that happens, oh, all those things add up. Belief without action backing up the belief is a religion that does not mirror what Jesus embodied or what Jesus taught the disciples. Out of gratitude for what God has done for us, we must act. Sacrificing ourselves, sometimes sacrificing, sacrificing our comfort and our advantages for the good of others. And if we are not compelled in our heart to do so, then it's likely that we haven't truly encountered the holistic love of God for ourselves. The divinely inspired writer of today's epistle shares that our faith will be legitimized by how willing we are to embody it and tell the truth even and maybe even perhaps especially when it costs us. This is the challenge that all of us are called to rise to in this post-resurrection world. Under our own power, this challenge is impossible. To do what is not natural for me requires a savior, a good shepherd who is willing to do for me that which I cannot do for myself. I hope that this message speaks to you and encourages you to go beyond the believing and declaring to really focus on the truth and the action. And I want to close the message now with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, you are the good shepherd. Come among us today and minister to our need. May each of us feel your presence with us and keep us close to you, walking with us and leading us to where you need for us to go, comforting us with your persistent goodness and mercy. Lord, give us what we need to thrive in this life and help us to see what you give us as all that we really need. Make us be people who are grateful for the gifts that you've given us. We ask in the confidence that because of your love for us, we lack nothing we really need. Amen. I hope the message spoke to you today. Don't forget that we do have a children's activity printable that goes along with our message today. And you can share that with the littles in your life. Do the coloring pages. I've had a lot of people send those to me by email, which is kind of fun to see. And we've also got a lot of events that are coming up and a lot of information there. So check out the, this week's announcements at pensvalleyparish.info on today's worship page for April 21st, 2024. Until next time, have a wonderful and very blessed week.